There were several developments, not just in Nigeria this week, but across the African continent. Um, as we speak, NLC has decided to go on strike. We've seen the first um, or inaugural meeting of the Federal Executive Council. Um, some states are also having the first meeting of their state executive council. Um, this is standpoint. I am precious, Amayu. Now, by far, one of the biggest news this week was another coup in Gabon. Now, the African Union has suspended Gabon following the takeover of power by the military in that country. And that's days after the conduct of its 2023 presidential election. The African Union Commission for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, during its meeting on the development in Gabon on Thursday, reached the decision. The meeting was chaired by Ambassador Willy uh, Uyamtwe of Burundi. The commission held that the country would not benefit or be part of any AU activities until democracy is restored. Meanwhile, the junta in defiance of the AU announced that it will swear in General Bryce Nguema as transitional president on Monday. The junta's spokesperson revealed that the general's inauguration will be held at the country's constitutional court. I recall that a group of senior military officers in Gabon on Wednesday said they had seized power in the capital in order to overturn the results of the recent election and remove a leader whose family has held power for almost 56 years. Now joining me on Standpoint is Professor of Political Science and African Studies, Toi Falola. He joins us virtually from the United States. Good to have you join us, Prof. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. So the last time you and I spoke, um, almost like you knew that this was going to happen, you had said that, look, um, some African countries, uh, using your word, were ripe for a coup, and you had mentioned even Gabon. And, and that's, you mentioned that, look, because of the of the long stay in power by um, Bongo. But should we see this in the context of what's going on in uh, Francophone countries, or does this stand on its own? Well, it's not going to stand on its own. Equatorial Guinea, their president in Basogo has been there for 43 years. Nobody can remove him. For Bia, 40 years. His own citizens cannot remove him. He's grooming his son to succeed him. Sasu Ngueso, 38 years, Republic of the Congo. Museveni, a former socialist and labor leader, 36 years in Uganda. Muswati, 36 years. When Santos died uh, of Angola, he ruled for 38 years. Idris Debi, 31 years. His son has succeeded him. Um, Eritrea has been there for 27 years. Uh, he reelected himself twice. And Eritrea is one of the most repressive countries uh, in Africa. Our neighbor, Yadema, he succeeded his father. His father governed for 38 years. So when he died in 2005, he, he put himself in power. Obasanjo was very worried and said, look, you can't do this. But they agreed that he should go and do a sharp election. And they keep winning this election. So I'm, I'm very glad you started with this good question. Because we shouldn't just be interested in military coup. People tend to forget that there are also civilian coup. Let me spell it out for you. There are many, many cases of electoral fraud. Anytime you do an electoral fraud, it's, that's a coup, that's a civilian coup. And 13 African countries, 13, since 2012 have, have done civilian coup. In other words, they, they, don't win, they didn't win the election and they put themselves there uh, through fraudulent means. But, but there are also other civilian coups that people do. When you change constitutions, as they did in Gabon, the Bongo family had been ruling Gabon for 56 years, conducting fraudulent election. The recent one, he did not win the election. They just announced election. Remember, we have elections in Cameroon, Benin, Togo, Equatoria, Guinea. All these are fraudulent elections. And when they do those fraudulent elections, they also do another coup. 
as you find in, in Cote d'Ivoire, as you find in Central Africa, as our, as our friend in Senegal wanted to do, in which you do what is called tenure elongation. You just assemble your parliamentarian and they do this tenure elongation for you. And it's important to, to understand that those electoral fraud, tenure elongation, attempts to change the constitutions, they are also cool, only not conducted by, by, by the military. So, and I'm happy that you've started with a very good question. And Prof, two questions yes. arise from what you just said. One of them is, um, some of these people who have now stayed really long in power, um, also started as um, freedom fighters. Most of them were revolutionaries. You know, people thought, and look, you have fought for this country, you know, fought for the indep independence, um, take over power, you know, as a way to say thank you. And some of them have done worse than, you know, um, what they had fought for. And one wonders why, why most times is that the case, that, you know, activists, as it were, um, always end up disappointing the people. And then number two is, case in point, what's happening in, in Rwanda. And um, people say, look, Paul Kagame is doing very well, but he has amended the constitution um, a, a number of times just so he can stay in power. Should we say because he's doing well and so his tenure allegation is justifiable? No, we, we can't say that, unfortunately. And um, Rwanda has been, I've had conversation regarding Rwanda, including directly speaking to people at the highest level of government in Rwanda. So, uh, two, two questions. We have cases in which socialists become socialites. Mm. <laughs> as in our friend Mugabe in Zimbabwe, he started as a hero. And then he tasted power. He wanted to transfer power to his wife. Museveni, remember, started as a socialist, as a, as a labor leader. And you see how repressive he became. It's, this is a person I've spoken about, his, his behavior twice. On, uh, 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 that, look, you can't do this. Rwanda, people have told him that you are doing exactly what the colonialists did, in which you are governing for a long time, but you are not laying platform for democratic institutions. He's doing well, infrastructure, economically, but it's very repressive. You can't go to Kigali and say whatever you like. I mean, if you are a citizen, it's just to, going to clamp you into jail, just like that. So, so, and by not laying the democratic institutions for his country, many of these good achievements that he's doing, just as you have in Mugabe, is just going to destroy those credentials and, and destroy those legacies. And then you have the conception of leaders as messiah. Remember, we had this phenomenon in Nigeria as well, in which they began to see themselves as messiahs, that without them, their country will collapse. Without them, their country will not do well. People have criticized my good friend, Obasanjo, for having a concept of winning messiah. I remember when Abacha was in power, many of you may not know that he sent a delegation to North Korea to do what? to go and study how to stay in power forever. Um, but for his illness that killed him, uh, dislodging Abacha would have been extremely difficult. So, and you see how the opposition forces and, and the clerics, Ulama, Marabu, said, look, Senegal is president, you have to go. Because it is, he already perfected the means to change this constitution. Bear in mind, I characterize these constitutional changes, this same power has also coups conducted by civilians against their own people. And there's an ongoing coup that we, we don't talk about. They are not in the military. They are not in the government. They are not civilians. They are using the agency of religion to build arms, like Boko Haram, like ISIS, like what is going on in the Sudan, in the Sahel, following the overthrow of Gaddafi. And they are building strength in which one of their desires is to take over the government. Mali almost crumbled. Okinawa almost crumbled. 
Boko Haram had reached Nasarawa State, close to Aso Rock. So we don't talk about these people as well. But these are also coups in the making that we should pay attention to. Mm. And, and Prof, in the case of the situation in Gabon and some of these countries where you've had um, leaders who have stayed in power for a really long time, one really wonders if it takes a coup to, to get, you know, some level of action and, and joy, because we saw people rejoicing in Gabon. Does it really take a coup? Because sometimes when you look at these military leaders, they become worse, even in office. No, no nobody wants a military coup. Nobody wants a military leader. It is, is the worst, one of the worst forms of governance you can have. But if you cannot dislodge these people who stay in power, as in that of Gabon, for so long, the question we should pose, and we, we posed it at Madame Fodio last week when they did a conference on Niger, what do you do if democracy doesn't work? What do you do if a group of politicians want to control power for forever, and what do you do if, as in the case of Bia, his minority group constitutes the army, they've been governing with them. And because citizens have become so powerless, that's why you see that rejoicing in Gabon. And Bia might not rejoicing in Gabon. I think what you saw in Nigeria was just his expression in Gabon. You know, the, the Gabonese in diaspora also rejoiced. They, they rejoiced in Europe. They rejoiced in, in the US. They were just jubilating, not just in Libraville. Uh, <laughs> even in, in the second largest city, they were rejoicing. Uh, in Dakar, in Senegal, the, the Gabonese small community gathered themselves and began to dance uh, on the street. What does this dancing represent? It, it, I, don't, I think they know that the military is not good. And in this particular case, it's so bad because you know the guy who overthrew, uh, who overthrew the president is an insider. It's his cousin. He's been governing with them. He was, he was the bodyguard of Mabongo, uh, who died in 2009. He's been part of the government. So it's a family coup. And, that, and there are a number of interpretations. One, the opposition won that election. Very embarrassing. It is, it, is not, it is not a coup that is going to reform that society. It is a coup that is preventing well-organized civilian opposition who won the election to come to power. So their new president is also discredited, is part of the system, is a member of the, of the group that has been repressing his own people and is as corrupt as the Bongo family as well. So it's, 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 it's like a palace coup in which a cousin <laughs> overthrew his blood, his blood relation. Nevertheless, the people are happy, thinking that maybe, maybe it is the beginning of something that will transit to a democracy that they want. Mm. It's a very sad situation. A, 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 and prob very, very really sad. sad situation. But, you know, just a minute after that coup in Gabon, we saw the military shake up in Cameroon and um, Rwanda. What does that tell you about how African leaders view um, what's going on on the African continent? And those, those are the ones you see. The, the, the immediate panic. There will be panic in, in, in Central African Republic. There will be panic not just in Cameroon and Rwanda. There will be panic in Togo. So the, there will be panic in Uganda. There will be panic in Equatorial Guinea. So what they do is standard practice. You reorganize your army. You 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 do what we do in Nigeria since 1999. You retire them at the very peak of their strength and energy. You destabilize them. You create many battalions and you keep moving them around. Uh, and you, and you, you, you do what Cameroon does, what Nigeria is doing. You tribalize it. You, you, you tribalize it to an extent that 
they won't be able to hold meetings among themselves because of, of lack of distrust. When you, in, in your final analysis, if you don't govern well, you are just deceiving yourself. Because the only thing that can improve, that, that, that can ensure that there will be no violent takeover of government is good governance. No other option. Mm. And, and what has happened in, in Gabon? What does this mean for the negotiations between ECOWAS and Niger? And, uh, the African Union, which you, you, when you are announcing this to your public, their threat is a joke. There's nothing they can do. It was, even when they were members, even when Niger was a member of the AU, when Gabon was a member of the AU, what are they, what are they receiving from it? What are they receiving? Some of them don't even pay their annual contribution. It is the Chinese that is maintaining the AU. It is the Chinese that give us the building. I've been to the building. <laughs> I know the place. It's the Chinese that built it. So if you say you are expelling somebody from AU, it's of no relevance, no consequences, because they are not benefiting anything. As far as ECOWAS is concerned with Niger, I think there's a consensus that they they can only solve this problem through diplomacy and negotiation. As I told you in your interview with me, that is the only option. And second, to negotiate a transition to democracy, as in the case of Togo, negotiate a transition to democracy and say, you are citizens of Niger. If you want to run for election, remove your uniform. Of course, they are going to win anyway. So, and that negotiation has to take place. The proximity between Nigeria and Niger is such that going to war is a problem. Nigeria does not have money to feed one million refugees should this crisis occur. It's, it's battling with its own economy at the moment, attempting to do palliatives for removal of oil subsidy. It's, it, it just does not have the capacity to handle a crisis. Second, people tend to forget genocide, that if you hit them, it's not as if they don't have retaliatory options. I've been to Niger, behind Buari Street, that's the name they call it, it used to be Dar es Salaam Street, and Nigerian communities, where the Yoruba people live, where the Igbo people live, who told you that? Young people in Niger will not go there and begin to kill them. So, hmm. so and the prof, option, for, yeah. for those who say, and I'm only I'm responding to what you just said, um, in the wake of this coup, for those who say, look, it might actually take um, use of force to stop the wave of the recent coup in Africa. Um, how do you respond? No, which which use of force? We, we have been a continent of coups. I just don't know why people tend to forget this history. This is what we've specialized in doing. We've, we've had over 200 coups in Africa. People shouldn't forget that. Uh, since um, we have two coups already this year, and before that, there had been coups in Burkina Faso, in Mali. How many people do you want to? Since 2017, We've been having coups. It is only that Niger brought this home to us because it is our neighbor. Uh, so we, are, we, are, we have been a continent of coups with 200 coup attempts since, since the 1960s. Um, between, we've had things slow down between 1990, 1990 and when the military took over power in Zimbabwe. Things slowed down. But now uh, it's now becoming a reality. But also remember, also remember the point I made earlier. Non-state actors, we are not paying attention to them. Mm. So, so capable, so they have tremendous access to AK-47. And they, they, these are ham, we call them armed bandits in Nigeria. They call them terrorists. 
in, in Mali, in Burkina Faso. Look at these countries, Somalia, Sudan, Mozambique, Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Kenya, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, all of them are facing serious insurgencies. And I want to make another prophetic statement as I did the last time. Any of this country can fall to any of these and bandage. And people tend to think it's not possible. It's possible. It only takes a coalition of the army to join any of these terrorist, terrorist organizations to overthrow government. Ask Syria. If you don't have evidence, ask Sudan. Because Sudan is in crisis today. The group that is attacking the Sudanese state is like your Boko Haram. It's like your ISIS. It's, it's, a, it's an armed bandit of terrorists that, 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 is, that is attacking the Sudanese states as we speak. And I'm more afraid of that. It's far more frightening. Mm. I mean, just, just looking at what happened in Afghanistan is enough point as um, to, to what you said. It took, it, took more than, it took more than 20 years, as it were, but it, it eventually happened. I will see how that, how that country has gone. But, Prof, let me ask you, because in the wake of this coup, one of the biggest conversations is the question of the democracy question and whether it is the right um, system of government for the African continent. Is it democracy that is the problem? Do we need our own kind of democracy? Or is it our leaders that are the problem? Well, thank you for that question, because people have been asking whether a liberal democracy is what is suitable for us. In fact, I've challenged my friends to let us all meet in Abuja and have this conversation. Because the Western form of democracy is conduct election and go home. But you know, those people who are in power are the ones conducting election. It is a member of, the, of, of, of Bongo's family who is, the, who is the head of the electoral commission in Gabon. People appoint their friends and political associates as electoral commissioners in many of these countries. So it is only once in a while that the coalition of opposition forces can mobilize and defeat them, as in the case of Yame in Gambia. He miscalculated. That's basically what cost him his power. He miscalculated thinking the strategy he put in place to win power all the time was there. And he just made a big mistake by the way he wanted them to vote, saying they should use beads to vote instead of um, materials that he could destroy. And that cost him his presidency. That small mistake cost him his presidency. Yeah. The other thing, People have been suggesting, why don't we study China? It's not a democracy, it's more of a bureaucracy. People have suggested as far back as the 80s, as far back as the 70s, people like Azikwe had suggested it. There's a concept of rotational presidency that instead of wasting all your money that you don't have, we spent 500 over close to 400 billion this, this year to produce those senators, members of the House, and the president. They say what? That in the, in the Chinese model, this is a substantial amount of money you can use to build roads in, in different parts of the country. That why don't we explore an alternative model? And in that alternative model, we will arrive at a system that suits us well. Mm. Uh, nobody to repeat is suggesting coups or military option. It, it is not an option at all. Absolutely. It's a dead end, and we don't pray for that. Mm. So the, the more resources we put on reforming democratic institutions, the more we deepen democracy, the more civil societies say, we will not allow you to rig election. Mm. 
We will fight for transparency. We will fight for accountability. We won't let you steal our money. It's better for all of us in the final analysis. Otherwise, and, and interesting, you democracy... mentioned the, the, the civil society question, Prof, because we, we need to have a more vibrant um, civil society. I wish we can continue this conversation, but I'm told my time is up. Always an interesting time speaking with you. And hopefully I'm part of that, your, converse, your conversation with your colleagues in Abuja, Prof. Thank you as, uh, so much as always. Professor of Political Science much. and African Studies, Toyin Falola. Thank you.